Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Gary Gray, Director of Athletics at East Stroudsburg University, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's webinar entitled Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion in College Athletics, A Call to Action. Tonight's program is the second in a 12-part series that ESU Athletics will host between now and February 2022 with one speaker each month addressing the same topic, but each in their own unique and, and personal way. East Stroudsburg University is a diverse university uh, where diversity, equity, and inclusion are highly valued. However, we all recognize uh, much more can be done, not only locally, but also within our state, within our country, and, and even globally to improve our society in so many ways. We know we can do better, and that's our goal. To cause change, action must occur. To cause action, discussions must occur, ideas must be shared, and commitments to change must be made. It is with this idea that we've created this speaker series. During tonight's presentation, you're invited to send in questions or comments by way of the chat function at the bottom of your screen. Those will go to uh, Mr. Noah Strone, who you see on your screen, Coordinator of Athletics Operations here at ESU. When our speaker has concluded her remarks, Noah will serve as our moderator by sharing those questions and thoughts uh, you send in with our speaker, uh, uh, for our speaker, uh, or, or for her comment. Um, I may have one or two, Dr. Enewalt might have one or two, Noah might have one or two, but most of all, we hope you will send in a question or make a comment by way of the chat function. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nancy Jo Greenewalt, Professor Associate Director of Athletics for Student Athlete Success and Senior Woman Administrator uh, at ESU Athletics to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Greenewald. Thank you, Dr. Gray. So um, I do have the distinct pleasure of introducing our speaker, the second one in our series. And this individual is someone that's very special to me and who's I've come to know over the last few years. And I'm very happy that she's part of our ESU family. Her name is Fan Yang. And as many of you know, Fan just completed her second year as the head coach for the ESU swim team. In her first year, she led the team to a 5-3 record and a 10th place finish at the PSAC championships. And, you know, in talking with Fan, as many of you know, she's pretty quiet and she doesn't really talk much about herself. But as a result, I also want to highlight a few achievements in terms of her own swimming career. First, in terms of swimming and coaching, she has 25 years of professional experience in both areas. And as a swimmer, she was a three-time champion in the 100 and 200 meter butterfly at the Beijing College Swimming Championships. In 1996, she was an Olympic qualifier in those same events. And during that same time period, she competed and placed in the 200 meter butterfly and the 800 meter freestyle events at the China National Championships. So there's no doubt that she's extremely accomplished and her coaching a career also spans through college club and camp experiences. So as some of us know, Fan grew up in China, but her Pursuit of an educational degree, in this case, a master's degree, took her to New Zealand. And after earning that degree, she returned to China where she spent the next nine years working as a swim coach and teaching assistant at the International School of Beijing. In 2012, she came to the United States having recently married Dr. Pang Zhang, a faculty member in ESU's health and physical education department. And they have two children, Christina and Matthew. So having grown up in China, there's no doubt that Fan's life journey has been very different from any of our own. And Fan, for that, I'm really, really happy that you decided to tell us your story tonight and your willingness to be here. So I'm passing the torch to you and I look forward to hear what you have to say. Thanks, Fan. Thank you, Dr. Greenwald, for introducing me. And also thanks to Dr. Gray and the athletic department to, uh, for providing me the opportunity to present today. Uh, I'm Fan Yang, I'm the ESU swimming coach. There are two parts about my presentation. First part, I will give you a little bit of introduction about myself and my background. 
And the second part, I will share with you what I think about um, diversity, equity, and inclusion through my own experience. Okay, I'm gonna start with my name. There are some fun facts about my name. So when people ask me my name, I tell them my name is Fan, and then they go, what? So I'll go like, just like the fan on the ceiling, and they go, got it. But actually, in Chinese, I'm not the fan on the ceiling. The pronunciation of my name is Fan. The meaning of the character actually means sailboat. Also, in China, we call people's last name first. So my name would be Yang Fan instead of Fan Yang. So my family and friends wouldn't even know who Fan Yang is. So for example, um, this is Yao Ming, a former NBA player from China. Yao is his last name and Ming is his first name. That is how people say name in China. Okay. And my background. I was born and raised in Shijiazhuang city in Hebei province. It is about 300 kilometers south of Beijing. As you can see from the map, the star here is Beijing and the little red dot is Shijiazhuang city. It is a medium sized city located in the northern part of China. By medium size, I mean 11 million populations which is very similar to the entire population of Pennsylvania. <laughs> and when I talk about myself, I must mention my swimming experiences. It is my swimming career and training experiences really shaped my thoughts, my personality, life, and who I am today. I started swimming when I was six, then I went on to swim professionally from age of 11 to 17. I would swim like twice a day and seven days a week and more than 350 days a year with an average of 1800 miles a year. I qualified for Olympic trial in uh, 1996 when I was 15. The professional uh, system in China is very different from USA. Instead of choosing to be a professional athlete after your college, and we make our decisions at very young age. Like I um, become a professional when I was 11, but for like diving and gymnastic, they become professional even at younger age, maybe under 10. So it's very different from um, USA. And that leaves professional athletes very limited choices in life. So most of professional athletes would become PE teachers or coaches later on in life. So after I retired from professional swimming, I continued to swim at college for another four years. So I had been swimming for a total of 15 years. And my education background, I received a bachelor degree in athletic coaching from Beijing Sport University in China. It is the most well-known sports university with lots of sports and professional athletes. There are about 100 indoor and outdoor sporting venues. And I also received a master's degree from uh, Massey University in New Zealand with major in business management. And my perception of uh, diversity, inclusion, and uh, equity and inclusion I personally really benefit a lot from diverse environment and it, it makes me become more open-minded and it makes me realize and appreciate the differences between people, cultures and ideas. It is also make me more appreciate of myself and my own culture. And I also learned better ways of doing things. And I believe that when equity and inclusion exist in the environment, people become more productive. Uh, here is some of my personal experience. Uh, I studied in New Zealand 
So I grew up in China with more than 99% of population pure Chinese. My neighbors and my friends were all native Chinese. I mostly saw people with like different race and nationalities from TV at when I grew up. But now there are more like Western people visit China, not like before, but when I was growing up, there was not many uh, Westerners. So I really thought of how other people would do things. I would assume that the rest of the world do the things to do the things the way Chinese do, you know. And going to New Zealand was my first time going overseas. It was even my first time took the flight at age of 21. After 13 hours of flying, I landed on a totally different world without knowing much English. Instead of seeing a lot of people like I used to, I saw more nature, as you can see from the picture. And the, the way people talk, eat, dress, and behave were so different. Even the way people greeting each other is different from China. In China, we're greeting each other by saying, hello, have you eaten today? Or, hi, you look fatter. That's what I heard most after I graduated from college when I see my friends. Or you look skinnier. In New Zealand, I soon learned that people say, how are you? Our Maoris, Maori are the original people from New Zealand, like Aborigines from Australia and uh, Indians from USA. So Maoris greet each other with honey. And that is press your nose and forehead with the other person's nose and forehead together. And you should never, never comment on people's weight and never ask a woman's age. People eat with fork, forks, knives, and spoons. We use chopsticks. Everything was so fascinating and different, interesting. So studying in New Zealand is such an eye-opening experience for me. I got to meet people uh, with people from different countries like Korea, Japan, Canada, Australia, and Thailand and USA. One thing I learned was that there are so many differences in people. In order to work efficiently with people from different backgrounds, first, we need to be aware of the differences. Then we need to embrace and celebrate them. Honeymoon phase went by very fast. I quickly experienced some uh, cultural shock and learned the word discrimination. There are so many stereotypes about Asians. Like Asians are good at math and everyone can play piano. I only wish that was true for me. When I watched my daughter doing her math homework goes five plus four and take forever, I was like, is she Chinese? So if you ask me more examples of being discriminated, honestly, I can't think of many. There was no people pushing me into a subway. There was no people kicking me for no reason on the street. However, I do feel it and know it is there because lots of times it is just a microaggression. It is just the way some people think of you and the way they look at you and you can feel it and you know there is no respect for you. But at the same time, you also question yourself Am I just being too sensitive or it is really what I thought it was? So over time, just like Coach Kaba said, you eventually become numb to the discrimination and learn to deal with it. I think I have uh, benefited greatly from my athletic experience. It taught me to keep my head up when I'm in difficult situations. It taught me that when there is a problem, seek for solutions rather than complaints. Even though studying and living in another country can be tough and challenging, but there are always and always so many kind people out there. And their, their love warmed my heart and their love make me believe that all the challenges can be conquered. I remember when I started my master program when I was living in a hostel, I was really like homesick and feel a lot of stress from my studies. And my roommate who is a local New Zealander and she planned a surprise birthday party for me. 
she and my other friend, they together made a surprise birthday cake and uh, gifts and they sing a song, they sing a birthday song. I was really happy, but I cried really hard. <laughs> I would never forget about that day. Uh, academically, I was kind of struggle at the beginning with uh, English, really stressed out about my assignments and all the homework. And I also learned the, the word uh, plagiarism, which never happened in China. So um, that's a lot of stress, but a Canadian exchange student offered me a lot of help. All my assignments for my master degree were edited by her. Without her help, I, wouldn't, I would not have survived my degree smoothly. And um, my working experience at International School of Beijing at 2005, I went back to China and started working at the International School of Beijing. ISB has about over 16,000 students from 50 different nationalities. I worked in the same office with four male colleagues from three different countries. A boss from Greece, a head coach from Australia and two other Chinese uh, assistant coach from local areas. It was great nine years with a lot of good memories. We sometimes will talk with each other and check how things are. And now my former Greek boss is in Malaysia and Australian head coach is in Taiwan and two Chinese coworkers are still in Beijing ISB. There were certain, there were certainly this disagreements and conflicts between thoughts and things. But everyone tried to listen and communicate. My experiences uh, in ISB taught me that the most important thing to work efficiently is to communicate. To communicate in a way that others understand. Try to, try to listen. Listen to what the person is really trying to say. The picture is ISB and that's the pool I was working at for nine years. So my working and living experience at USA. In America, I have made some good friends, found God and also got a job I love and a good family. I cannot complain. I really felt fortunate and blessed. About um, nine years ago, I came to East Strasbourg to unite it with my husband. On the flight, I was reading a book called Swimming Triangle. Then a flight attendant approached to me who is now my friend. And she is asking me why I was reading a swimming book. So we started talking and then I found out that she has three children were all swimmers at swim at Eastern Aquatic Club. So two weeks later, arrived USA, I started my coaching job at Eastern Aquatic Club. <laughs> the experience of being a club coach landed me a system coaching position at Lafayette College. At Lafayette College, I learned totally different coaching philosophy from Coach Daly in comparison with my Chinese professional coaches. Under Coach Daly's leadership, uh, there was one swimmer qualified for Olympic trial in 2016. And there are times things get hard, life gets hard, but with the spirit and the strength that sports has inspired me and also by having faith in God and knowing that he has planned things better than I could possibly imagine, I felt grounded. For example, being given the opportunity to work at ESU, I felt honored that I go to work. I got to work with some of very bright, talented, and determined student athletes. I really enjoyed coaching them and having conversation with them. Get to know them more than just a swimmer or students. At ESU, I met the coaches who are willing to share their recruiting strategies with me, and I met the coaches who texting me, wish me luck before the meets. And I also met the coaches who wrote me Chinese note to wish me luck. And the coaches who congratulate me after my meets, trainers who go in extra miles to make my swimmers to be able to compete. I met people who come early morning try to fix my touch pads. 
And I also met people who have been encouraged me, guide me all the way. And the administration who support our team to compete during pandemic. And even before this presentation, I got so many texts from my colleagues and my swimmer, wish me good luck and tell me I'll be, I'll be doing great. I really felt, felt loved. And I'm just so thankful for the people I work with and the help they have provided. To conclude my presentation, I truly believe that diversity is a good thing. It requires a lot of sincere communication, lots of awareness to the differences in people, also requires a lot of mutual respect and requires understanding, more understanding between each other and listening to each other. Simply just be kind to one another. This is all I want to share with you. Thank you all so, so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Fan. I uh, appreciate that. Uh, I know we've got some questions coming in and we'll, we'll give Noah a few minutes to uh, kind of organize them. And, and But I, I'd like to start off and ask a couple and I think maybe Dr. Greenewald uh, has one too, but um, I, I have so many, but I'll, I'll just be careful. I'll just start off with one uh, and then we'll get to some in our audience. And if we have any extra time, um, perhaps I can ask one or two more, but um, you, met, you mentioned that um, participation in sport has uh, has impacted your your own view of diversity equity and inclusion and 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 you know the the uh, sport experiences we know sport can be wonderful for bringing people together and connecting and things like that as i'm sure it did for you in china um did it did it did you ever experience any kind of challenging situations though. And, and I'm wondering, because you, you said that, you know, while you were swimming, you were in China and 99 plus percent of the population was Chinese. Um, how about um, as a female uh, swimmer, did you experience any sort of exclusion or discrimination that, you know what I mean? Um, that it, you either learned from or grew from or had to respond to or, or, or how about that? So maybe we can kind of introduce the, the, uh, the, uh, the gender uh, piece into, into your background too, as uh, not only Chinese, of course, but as, as a woman. Uh, any thoughts on that or comments on that? Yeah. Uh, thank you for the question, Dr. Gray. Um, when I was a swimmer in China, I never experienced any discrimination. They are women, they are men, it's quite balanced. Uh, but when I started working, like in a working environment, I, I felt like there are more uh, males than females. That's definitely true. I think in the sporting um, career, like that is quite common. Okay. And, and if I could just do a follow up, and I know we've got a bunch of questions coming in now, so thank you. Please keep them coming. Um, so your first kind of real diverse, uh, very diverse experience was New Zealand, yeah. and your second was the United States. Is there anything in e from either of those countries that kind of stood out, where uh, just you know where you ever kind of had to weigh things in your mind about? where you fit in from a diversity standpoint or equity or inclusion. And I'll let you pick whether it's New Zealand or US or was there something that kind of all of a sudden struck you? Uh, yeah, I, I think like the, this, I mean, sorry, communication like part, you know, the way you communicate with people is quite different. Like in Asia, like especially in China, people tend to be more uh, conservative. So they don't communicate in a direct way. You know, like you, you're going to the Western world and people say things more directly and mm. it's more outgoing, you know? Okay. Yeah, and also uh, when I was studying in New Zealand in the class, like if I was in China, we were told more to listen, you know? Don't raise your hands up, don't ask questions. But then like when I went to New Zealand for my language study and teacher kept asking the Asian people like Chinese students, why you guys don't ask any questions? We just are so not used to ask questions. We just follow the rules and do what is told, you know. 
Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, Dr. Greenwald, do you wanna ask uh, your question and then we'll get into the questions uh, from the group? Uh, you're on mute still. So Fan, obviously, you know, Dr. Gray alluded to you having traveled to New Zealand and now you're living in the United States. So, mm -hmm. you know, there, there had to be, I guess, a lot of adaptability on your part, but I'm sure there's aspects of home and your own culture that you miss. So mm -hmm. how do you how do you try to maintain that part of your identity and you know, make it part of your day-to-day -day life here in the U.S., or perhaps maybe you don't, but how have you tried to continue to have that be part of your life? Uh, yes, it's like the, the, the food, you know, like that's the part we miss the most. So people say your stomach love your country the most. So uh, me and my husband cook Chinese food every day. And we go to like, when we go out to eat, if we go to uh, some other cities or places, we always try to look for the Chinese restaurants. Do you find that those restaurants are somewhat uh, authentic or you just put up with them? They're as close as you can get uh, like as, you from home. It's not really close, but you go to like big cities like New York, like, you know, Chinatown, they make really good food there, like, you know, but the smaller um, town or places is not really close. But I guess after you haven't tried your ch local food for so long, you are like eating everything. <laughs> that's great, Fan. I, I like Chinese food and you got to find the right place, that's for sure. Um, so we'll, we'll start with some of our questions here that are coming in. Thank you everybody for submitting them so far. Uh, please, you know, keep on submitting them and we'll get to everybody's questions as, as quickly as possible here. So first question I have for you, Fan, is mm -hmm. uh, will you have or have you ever brought your children to China to show them where you grew up or maybe family or, or other people in, in where you grew up? Uh, yes, we, we did. Two years ago, I brought my kids back to China. They were so excited. And they learned so much Chinese just within two months that we taught them like every day here. Like where um, my husband and me grow up. So they got to see like the other, uh, like uh, what the real China is look like. And we were trying to bring them back again. So you brought them once or more, just one time, right? Just the one time. We were trying to go this year, but the situation wouldn't allow it. Gotcha. So what's the best advice for like our international students or even international faculty? Um, what's the best advice that you've gotten on moving to a different country? Like you went, you went halfway across the world and, and uh, came to the US. What, what, what's that advice like? Um, I would say like be open-minded and don't be too sensi over sensitive because once you become sensitive, you can take everything to another extreme level, you know, and just uh, try to um, like learn uh, why the people do things this way in this particular culture. And I think you understand better and like try to keep the communication going, you know, like I think most of the time it's just a misunderstanding. And when you have the conversation, when you have the communication and both parties understand better and work better together. Definitely communication is key in any, in any relationship or any, any situation. So that's, that's important. Yeah. Um, so did you end up experiencing, following up kind of on that, did, did, have you ever experienced any discrimination at first when you came to America? I mean, obviously now there's a little bit more having to do with Corona, but um, initially when you got here at all? Uh, initially when I got here, I see more like, you know, deers running around. <laughs> but I mean, like I already, I feel myself like the experience I had in New Zealand and in uh, international school in Beijing already like immune me in a way, like I don't take things too seriously, like when there is um, a kind of like a discrimination. So it's quite easy to keep going, pass it on.
So, I mean, as a follow-up, and actually it segues quite nicely, talk about some of the challenges you faced in coaching in those various different countries that you've worked. Are they similar? Are they different depending on the country comparatively to the U.S. or China? Oh, it's very different. Um, when I grew up with a Chinese professional Chinese coach, you know, like uh, the coach would tell you to do like this really hard workout and would not give you much uh, like um, uh, encouragement, would just uh, tell you where you can improve rather than like comments on how, how good you did for the particular part. And that is the way like coaches do things. And that is also the way I think our parents try to deal things with us. So they think that the discipline can make us become better, you know. And come coaching at USA, I feel uh, students, they taking more like, you know, um, encouragement, positive comments better than you giving them some, you know, um, like where their mistakes you should improve, you know, like those kind of things. So it's quite different. Well, you see, you seem to have quite a few fans, uh, no pun intended, in the exercise science department here on campus because we've got a couple of questions from them. Um, you mentioned getting some help from other coaches on, you know, recruiting strategies and stuff like that. Are there any other areas where you think you could use some more support or help from other coaches or other? Uh, let's use faculty members as the example. Yeah, and now I can't think of too much because whenever I have my uh, question or problem, I just reach out to my colleagues and they will like, you know, uh, like really patient to help me. So I can't think of any at, on top of my head, no. Like I mostly have the questions about recruiting, you know, like, and they, uh, quite a few coaches really tell me the strategies, how they recruit. Because in China, we don't recruit swimmers. Like, this is very new for me. So being that you are a young coach in, in your career and not, you know, and obviously this is the first time that you're a head coach too, learning all of uh, those things, what advice can you give young coaches that are entering, uh, you know, the field, whether it's obviously not just swimming, but any, anything, any coaching experience, head coach, assistant coach, et cetera? Uh, I would say be humble and be ready to learn. Uh, you can always learn so much from people around you. And I think sometimes after you graduate you with a degree, you think you know so much about swimming or about any other sports, but actually the people out there, they have more experience. So just uh, be like, you know, ready to learn and listen to what they say. That's, uh, that's definitely great advice. Looking at some of these other questions, feel free to keep sending them in. We got a couple more here, a couple more coming in. So feel free to continue to send on in your questions to us here. Um, do your children speak Chinese fluently at home? Uh, is it spoken in, in the house? Do they speak it outside the house? Give a little background on, on that. Uh, they were speaking more fluently when they were younger and after they went to school, you know, their peers all speak English and like my son growing up older and he can have conversation with my daughter, they all start talking in English. But we really try to keep teaching them and my husband teach them Chinese at home every day and try how to write and how to read. I think that is the best way to keep uh, part of the Chinese culture and with within the family and also later on in life they know like more they can understand better where they are from so just a, a follow-up to that because i know chinese or or any any of the asian cultures for that matter are very culture-based right and, and very family oriented how does that um connection to your family back in china um you want to be able to pass that down to them obviously um, like my parents and my husband's parents, they visit often. Since we had our first child, they come like, they take in turns to come like every six months. 
so I think they have strong tie between, uh, my children have strong tie between their grandparents. And I, as long as they can still like, you know, do the flight, I will keep inviting them to come here. And we'll also try to go back to China. So let them learn like what the more about Chinese culture, you know. And I'll ask another one while Noah just uh, mm -hmm. catches his breath there and can kind of scan through some uh, some of the other ones. I know we've got some that are a little longer and he may need some uh, reading time. When you when you were still in China and, and before you went to New Zealand, and then you went back to China and before you came to the US, did you have any kind of preconceived ideas of what the experience was gonna be like in New Zealand and the people and how you're gonna be treated and then the same for the US? So in either of those cases, were, is what you expected kind of what you got or was it different? Uh, very different. Reality was different from, okay, talk yeah. a little bit about that. Okay, so before I went to New Zealand, I was thinking, you know, like I heard people going to overseas, they can do part-time jobs and they make money easily. And you will learn English just like within a few, you know, weeks, mm. you'll be very fluent. That was my expectation. And I went there and I started with my language uh, class, which I found out most of the students were like Chinese and like Asian, Korean, Japanese, you know. So that was quite um, shocked. I was quite shocked. And also like for the working part, you just make a little bit of money, but you don't make enough to support uh, your tuition. Okay. And before I came to US, I, you know, US is one of the strongest country in the world. And you see all those USA movies, like big cities. Like you know, all like New York City, and I was I was assuming that you know I'm I I was going to a city, and then after I arrived here, um, I was like thought my husband was driving me past the town or something, and then he showed me here is home, so I was really like shocked, but he was telling me this is like seventy percent of USA, and that's the true USA culture and people, you know where they live. Yeah, that part was quite shocking to me. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, a good question for you to elaborate on a little bit here um, as well, Fan. Um, do typical Americans have habits in their everyday life that may be considered offensive to a Chinese person? Offensive to a Chinese no, not really. Okay. Yeah. Um, how do you find then maybe um, if people are offensive to people of Asian descent or Chinese culture, um, how do you find that people can be more respectful of, you know, your culture and, and stuff like that? Um, I feel now, I think nationwide, I think start talking about, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I think that's really important. I mean, the discrimination is being exist for a long time. And now, like, I, I feel the medium has more coverage on that. All those conversations, I think, will help raise awareness and how, so this is a first step to communicate. I think things, I believe things will get better. So that's obviously, uh, just to follow up on that, obviously that's been a, a major news story since the coronavirus has hit and, and, and the issues that have been around, again, Asian hate and, and using that terminology is what's come out of this, obviously. Um, it, it's It's been a struggle, especially in our, in our bigger city areas, and we're mm -hmm. close enough to two big metropolitan areas. Mm -hmm. What have you seen from either friends of yours that may live in those areas or what have you uh, dealing with some of that, you know, that, that issue of Asian hate? Yeah, um, I think first, I think this is not right. I think people definitely need to be more uh, tolerant and look at the things, you know, from different perspective. And also when I was talking to some of my Asian friends uh, who's from bigger city and they, they tell me they have concerns like going out at night or they worried going to the like uh, places with more people, you know, big cities. 
So they they worry, they watch out for their children more than before, you know. So I, I think that's something happened now. And I feel it's very sad, but I think we can definitely do better. Well, and is that specifically New York? I, I, I think you said big cities. Is it just New York or is it others too? And not to pick on New York necessarily, yeah. but uh, were you yeah. referencing New York there? Mm, yeah, I was just mm -hmm. referring as a big city. I think okay. big cities with uh, bigger populations, you know, sure, there are sure. going to be more conflicts than okay. the uh, smaller towns, smaller cities. Okay. Um, next question that we have for you here, Fan, is, um, is there anything from, I guess, your background or Chinese culture in general that you use in your career or, or how you coach um, with your team? Uh, yeah, like some of the coaching, like uh, the uh, swimming strategies, like I, I use it from what I learned from my uh, chi chi Chinese professional experience but have to be adapted into American uh, style, you know? Like say for example, in China, we, we, the coach will tell us to do 10 500s and we would do it. But here, instead of doing 10 500s, you have to separate them with like two 500s and then four of two 200s, something like that. You have to be more diverse in your sets, make it more interesting and think more how they are mentally willing to take your sets rather than just, you know, train them hard and do this. <laughs> yeah, just, looking, just looking through, yeah. sorry, just looking through our, uh, our yeah. questions here, making sure I've gotten to everybody's uh, Again, through them one more time. Dr. Greenwald, do you have another? You look like you're on the edge of your seat there. I think you just got another question, no? <laughs> Maybe not. Well, I was thinking about fans mentioning about how she has had to adapt her coaching strategies. Yeah. yeah. Um, what other ways have you felt you've had to assimilate into not just your mm. coaching, but into our culture itself? I mean, yeah. Do you feel like you've lost a part of your identity in, in being here? Or do you feel like you've enhanced who you are because of the, you know, the opportunity to have a foot in two different worlds? I mean, Good you question. know, do you feel like you've lost something or you feel like you've gained? I feel definitely I gained something. I feel like knowing this Western culture and make me realize uh, my Chinese culture even more. Like, like say for example, before I going overseas, I don't know how much I love China. And after I being in the other country, I felt like I'm a Chinese and I love my country even more. So I definitely feel that a different culture have added value to me rather than uh, making me feel lost. You know, I felt I know myself, who myself is better than, you know, uh, with just uh, being in the Chinese you see things from outside and you view your own culture, you view yourself and the way you do things. So Fan, I'll ask one last question and I think uh, Dr. Gray will wrap it up here. Um, it's been an absolutely great uh, presentation. So thank you. Okay. Um, you know, in, in talking about Chinese culture and I think this is some things that some people don't understand. You know, you talked about Chinatown in New York City and, and same thing, obviously, in, in the Philadelphia area, et cetera. But what makes those areas so special um, and so important to people of Chinese uh, backgrounds and cultures to, to feel, I guess, around their own or, or what have you? And, and what can other people take from, you know, learning those experiences or going and, and taking a walk through Chinatown and, and really um, learning about those culture, the culture? I would say just uh, the food. It's really the food, you know, like people like uh, Asian, Chinese people go to Chinatown, like looking for restaurants, like, you know, you don't really know people from Chinatown, but I think food is really like a main part of your culture. Like I, I like um, steak or burgers or sandwich, but I can't eat three days in a row, you know. Yeah, good point. Well, thank you, Fan. I'll let uh, Dr. Gray here wrap it up for us and uh, appreciate you uh, taking your time with us.
<laughs> yeah. Thanks, and, and, everybody. Uh, Thanks, man. And, and, and I know I think there's a lot to be said for the energy too. that, you know, when you go when you travel and you go to uh, uh, it, whatever the city is and whatever the unique uh, ethnic or cultural part of a city that that has that that um, a, a lot of uh, people from another culture. I just you just feel such a, a sense of great energy, you know whether it's Chinatown in New York or Chinatown in San Francisco or pick another culture, you know, it, it just, and, and I like your answer on the food. I, there's something to be said for that. That seems to be, there's, I think there's, we, sh we share a lot of, of, of good times and good memories around food, don't we? You know, like whether it's a, a traditional dinner or just travel and, and, and food and stuff, but yeah, I, I, I appreciate the energy too. So well, Fan, thank you very much. Uh, I'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, thanks very much, uh, Coach Yang, for sharing your thoughts with us tonight, uh, not only on this important topic of diversity and equity and inclusion, and you've made many, many good comments related to that, but also your background and, and how, you've tied, how, you, how you've tied your background into, into the topic. We really, really sincerely appreciate it, and, and Fan, we, we sincerely appreciate you. Uh, thank you for answering the questions from our audience and addressing the, uh, the comments we had from the webinar viewers. Uh, Noah, Dr. Greenewall, thank you also for your parts you played in tonight's program. And uh, finally, to everybody out there, thank you for joining us tonight uh, to be part of this ESU Athletic Speaker Series, the second one. We have 10 more to go. Um, we hope to see you again next month. Uh, keep your eye on our website, our social media. We'll announce the date, the time, and the speaker uh, coming up shortly. Um, and uh, we look forward to more interaction. Uh, share this. Uh, this will be archived on our website. Uh, we'll get the word out and, and hope that you will watch it again and, and think about uh, Fan's unique perspective that she brings to our Warrior Athletic Program. I think it's amazing. Her her professional background, her cultural background as a young professional, young professional, 11 to 17, and then her, her teaching and coaching in New Zealand and then back in China and now here. And, and it's from the strength of that diversity that, that we get to benefit, right? Our swimmers benefit. We as a, as a department benefit, our university, our community, and, 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 and she's just one person, I mean, but we all benefit so much. So multiply that by large numbers and think about the value that we gain from benefiting from the diversity that we each bring in, in perhaps many, many different ways. So Fan, thank you very, very much. Excellent job. We really appreciate it. And thanks everybody for tuning in. Uh, thank you and good night.